So this week's talk is going to be sort of in periphery to some of the events that are mentioned inside the book, just because there are people inside the stuff for this week that are mentioned inside the chapter that will become important later. Um, plus, I also want to revisit some of the ideas we've been talking about, about things that are being left out of the narrative um, by Hopkins, because he has a specific trajectory in mind that and a specific thesis that he is putting things into um, his narrative that work with his main thesis, right? Um, so uh, this week's chapter was The Artist in Crisis, um, or Is the Artist in Crisis from Bacon to Boys. Um, a couple things that are mentioned very quickly. The first one is, um, they talk about the Labor Party. Um, Something that I want you guys to be aware of um, is that there is a very famous um, art collector who we're going to be talking about later on in class named Charles Saatchi. And Charles Saatchi does um, advertising. That's how he's made his money. And that's how he buys his paintings. And what he does is he goes to the Royal Academy of Art, which is sort of the equivalent to like the Art Institute or Yale or um, RISD for England, right? And he goes and he finds up and coming artists and he will, while they are still relatively unknown, um, buy their work for a year. He's done this to um, Damien Hirst. He did this to Chris Ophelia. He did this to um, uh, Julian Schnabel. He did it to Jenny Seville. So artists that they're called the YBAs, the Young British Artists, um, are sponsored by Charles Saatchi and he buys their work when it's very cheap and and buys it for what for them is a significant amount of money and then through his endorsement of their work their work gets built up inside the market and then as a result their work becomes worth more and so sometimes Charles Saatchi, he, he increases the value of their work through using his brand name to purchase their work and through supporting them um, when it's relatively cheap to do so. So we're talking a little bit this week about commodity, which is one of the reasons why I think it's important to point out the fact that they, they talk a little bit about the Labor Party um, inside this chapter. And I thought that it's important to sort of see that Charles Saatchi is the one that creates this advertisement, um, labor still isn't working, right? So um, keep this in mind and sort of put it, put a thumbtack in it and we'll come back to Charles Saatchi at another time when we're talking about um, work that's happening inside the 1990s. So some other things that are being talked about and discussed inside this book, we're starting to get into some theory and some ideas that I would like to unpack a little bit for you. Some of you may have um, come across Michel Foucault. Um, some of his major ideas are the power of the gaze. Right, so you see here, this is the panopticon or a drawing of the panopticon. And the idea was that um, in the old days, this is coming from his book, um, Discipline and Punish. And in the old days, um, in medieval times, you would have punishments that would be inflicted bodily. And so the idea of doing things wrong came with it severe punishment, which you could anticipate the pain of things like being drawn and quartered. So four horses would, um, you'd be attached to four horses with all of their limbs and they would go out in the separate directions and pull you apart. And the idea of having to endure these punishments made you feel um, less inclined to do the kind of things that would get you into this sort of trouble, right? So the idea was that the punishment was so horrible that um, you wouldn't want to endure it and therefore you wouldn't do these things. So what happened was um, we started to change the type of punishment that um, people wanted, to, that people would give to each other during the Enlightenment period, right? And the idea was not to have cruel and unusual punishment. And so Michel Foucault um, says that what ends up happening is that we, instead of doing things because we're going to undergo 
a horrible punishment. We, we do things or we regulate our behavior because we feel like we are being watched, right? And the Panopticon is a prison which has one guard and all of the doors for the, the cells of the prisoners look out and they can all see the guard when they look out and therefore they believe that they are being watched, even though in reality, if they were able to break down the doors, they could overrun the guard, but because their vision is limited and because they see that they are being seen, their behavior and their riotous behavior or possibility of riotous behavior is regulated by one guard rather than um, by um, a million guards or whatever, right? So um, the belief in being watched affects your behavior. Um, Michel Foucault talks directly about art in relation to this. He mentions Las Meninas. Because we can only see the reverse side, we don't know who we are or what we are doing. Are we seeing, so are we looking in on a scene, or are those that are inside the work um, seeing us? Um, and relating to these ideas, Michel Foucault says that knowledge is power. Um, this relates to the concept of objectification. So Foucault cites the Renaissance as the historical birth of modernist systems of binaries. So what happens is, is whenever you have an object, when you objectify something, you're setting yourself up as the subject, right? So a subject always has to have an object and an object always has to have a subject. And Michel Foucault says that this is in, that these are set up in relationship to power. So then you have Jacques Lacan. Um, he was interested in um, psychology. He studied Freud. Um, he identified something that he called the mirror stage. And the mirror stage is where um, there is an infant or a toddler who doesn't really see the boundaries of himself and the rest of the world. And then when he reaches the mirror stage, he can look into a mirror and he can see that even though it seems identical to him, it's actually not of him, right? So it's something that's opposed to him. Um, that's recognition of self in opposition to small o other. Big o other is imbued with opposite identity characteristics in relationship to the idea of art, this is where we sort of get the idea of Orientalism. So Orientalism as a thing tells us a lot more about what Occidentalism is than it tells us anything about what this supposed um, other is, right? Um, which is one of the reasons why um, Edward Said writes this treatise about Orientalism and sort of breaks it down and says, you know, the study of Orientalism is really about how um, people in Western Europe set themselves up as the subject. So small other is that which is not us but is like us. Um, this is derived from Freud. Um, it's influence, it influences the concept of the death of the author which privileges reader audience. Then we talk about Eve Klein. Now, you guys are probably going to talk about Eve Klein um, in class, so I'm going to um, pass on him for a little bit, um, except that I want to read this little bit of something to you. So one of his first productions on the theme of the void was the famous exhibition of the void in 1958 entitled La Specialization de la Sensibilité la and I'm so sorry, Casey, somewhere you're cringing. Um, anyway, so you can see the this on the screen test. I'll read you the English. The specialization of the sensibility in the raw material state into stabilized pictorial sensibility. For this exhibition, Klein in, himself impregnated the space with artistic sensibility using blue as an intermediary. Indeed, whereas the interior space of the empty gallery was painted entirely in white, Parts of the exterior were decorated in blue. The display window was painted blue. Visitors were met by a blue curtain. The invitation cards and stamps were blue. And even the cocktails offered by the artists were tinted with methylene blue. Thus, the white space of the gallery could be perceived as being contaminated by the blue. So I believe that this is mentioned inside your text. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about it was because this is another place inside the Hopkins where there's an opportunity to talk about a piece of work 
which is actually going to be very essential to the Darby English, which we talk about um, much later in the course. It's our final reading of the course. And this is also from the artist David Hammonds, who I talked to you guys about last time in relationship to the work that he was interested in doing. Um, so this is the work by David Hammonds. And David Hammonds, there's a link to a YouTube video if you are interested in sort of viewing what it's like to be inside the space. David Hammonds is the same artist who did um, the work that we looked at in the last podcast. And he relates to some of the ideas that Carrie James Marshall is talking about. Um, he is a, he's a black artist who worked in the 1960s, as we said last time. And this piece is called Concerto in Black and Blue. It's mentioned inside the Darby English. It's also talked about a little bit more in depth inside um, the podcast that I have for that week. And what happens is you have a you have people who enter a darkened gallery space, which has white walls normally, who are given a blue flashlight and given the ability to um, go through this space with these flashlights that are giving off blue light. Um, so this is referencing um, Eve Klein. It's referencing Ralph Ellison, which we'll talk about more in depth when we talk about um, Darby English. But he's, he's doing a similar thing to the thing that was just described that Eve Klein did, only Hopkins doesn't mention him at all in relationship to what Eve Klein is doing, um, which is strange because he also talks about Eve Klein's body prints, and if you look at these two works, you'll see that this is um, David Hammonds, who has been painted with butter and then pigment put on top, and he's laid down to create this body print, which is indexical. And this is what Eve Klein was doing in the 1960s, which was painting the bodies of other people and then having them roll around in front of audiences at gallery openings and having these be action paintings, right? So David Hopkins is consistently sort of ignoring something major that is going to be really influential on stuff that happens in the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, he's ending his text in 2000. So it's a little strange that he doesn't include a lot of this stuff which occurs beforehand and leads to someplace which is pretty important. He also mentions in relation to Roland Barthes inside this text, um, we talk about the death of the author, text is not a line of words revealing a singular meaning, rather a space in which a variety of texts clash in conversation with each other. Um, this corresponds to the privileging of the spectator, which we talked about last time, and also relates to the problematizing of the gaze. So um, those are points which you can go back and look at again. But he talks about this piece, Larry Rivers, as being um, influential and very important in sort of displacing the Emanuel Lutz painting. He does not talk about Robert Colescott's George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware page from an American textbook. So um, we can see that there's a very specific trajectory that Hopkins is dealing with. And this is the same sort of thing that um, is persistently problematic about his text. Um, so I want you guys to keep that in mind in relationship to some of the stuff that we have talked about. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that. Um, and maybe you guys can, um, if you're interested, um, talk a little bit about this in relationship to some of the things that we read about in the chapter. Um, if not, it's a little bit of sort of support of this idea that Hopkins is biased, right? Um, which is something that I want you to take away with because I also think that Hopkins does a really good job of laying out what is sort of the death of the modernist art trajectory, um, which I think is really important to talk about as well. All right, so I'll see you guys soon.